Let's uh, let's uh, shift gears because we do need to uh, we need do need to think about those year-end reporting uh, activities. Um, uh, we'll be picking up the theme of structural change um, uh, in terms of the accounting implications and estimates. But uh, Jim, over to you. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, I thought I would focus on three things. Uh, I'd take a look at disclosure risks, disclosure and disclosure risks, some of the issues we've been talking about. The second is, as you go through your year-end meetings, the importance of uh, ensuring you have a robust CEO and CFO certification process in addition to the audit quality issues that Brian talked about. And then, uh, Don, come to the issue of accounting estimates, uh, which I think is going to be very, it's critical every year, and I think it presents a unique challenge this year. Um, so those are my three things. Uh, at the right-hand side of the chart in front of you is a shameless plug uh, for a new CPA uh, Canada publication on CFO certification, which was written by Alan Willis and myself. Um, we put out a publication and we put out a guidance for uh, audit committees and management in 2006, and the CPA Canada asked us to update this. We first said, "Well, you know, what, what's the importance?" So we said, "Okay, we'll do that." As we got into it, we became far concerned. A, we in 2006 we believed it was an important process. We now believe even more that it's an important process, and we think there are some levels of concern about how robust this process is now, so we'll talk about that. Um, and in your handout material, I'll also say there's some additional slides that uh, Don said I wasn't allowed to uh, present on the screen, uh, so I'll refer to them. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's talk to, uh, first of all, and switch to disclosure. Um, in, our, in our CPA Canada publication, Alan and I developed the, this sort of analysis of disclosure, and we tried to look at it and said, what are the layers of disclosure? And, uh, and uh, at the center, in the, in the shaded box, uh, circle, you'll see that's the quarterly and annual financial statements. Okay, so that, uh, um, the next one out is the other required disclosures. So, uh, Cameron, that would include the MD&A, the AIF, the proxy circular, uh, timely disclosure releases, other, other things that are required. Um, third layer out is the voluntary reports and information that companies provide, health and safety reports, environmental reports, social responsibility reports, all of those kind of things. And then in the outside layer, Don, is uh, the world of uh, Twitter, uh, social media, blogs, chat rooms, and all of that kind of thing that's going on. Um, so. Given that profile, uh, the question that boards and audit committees need to say is, what information in that disclosure universe moves the market? What is the information that moves the market with respect to your company? And that ties back, maybe, Don, to your question about you know, non-GAAP measures, or uh, where is that information? And, um, and then the second is, do we have the control structure matched up against the, uh, the uh, 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 disclosure universe and the key information that moves the market? Um, if the right-hand side of the chart, you can see two levels of control. Uh, one is controls over ICFR, which is internal control over financial reporting. That's the controls over the information in the financial statements. The second level out is disclosure controls. Those are the controls over the information that's required to be disclosed. But you can see then it stops. So what is the controls over the information as you move farther out into the disclosure universe? Well, it's primarily your disclosure policy and the processes and procedures that your company has put in place in order to implement that disclosure policy. Um, now, underneath all of that is the data. Okay? There's data that flows up and is communicated out. There's data that's kept internally. And as Patricia has said, that's where the hacktivists are often now attacking, is to get at the data. So the next level out, Don, is the disclosure that's made by somebody else that you don't make. And if you look at the Sony hack, well, that included a whole bunch of disclosures or the uh, WikiLeaks uh, stuff. That's all information that's being data that somebody unauthorized to your company has got a hold of and is communicating to the outside world. So what's the control over the data? And, and, uh, and as Patricia has indicated, you know, companies are investing a lot of money into big data, into trying to take data and data analytics and turn it into a competitive advantage. So that then exposes, that's, that then is, is a key uh, exposure. So what is the data governance that is uh, needed to oversee that, that data, the management and the strategic use of data and the control of data is appropriate? 
so one of the things, Don, I think is that we need to rethink our whole control structure now. You know, we can't just pigeonhole things into nice little packages like ICFR, DCNP. Everything's coming together because the electronic data is everywhere in a company. And, uh, and so we need to think about that, uh, start thinking about that differently and more holistically. Um, um, let me uh, talk just a little bit about two other types of risks, uh, Patricia, that you you did cover. One is liability risk, kind of thing, uh, because in the disclosure with year-end audit committees, we'll be thinking about the issue of well, what what is the accuracy and reliability of the information that we're approving and putting out, and what are the risks associated with that. Um, now, of course. In Canada, civil liability came into uh, effect. I can't, Cameron, 2005-ish, somewhere around that started. Um, well, if you go to a company near a economic consulting, uh, uh, and this is a slide that's in your handout, uh, put out a, uh, uh, some information that said since uh, 2005, there's been 52 civil liability cases filed. Um, 17 cases have been settled uh, for approximately 280 million. And 31 cases remain unresolved, which uh, the, uh, the total of the uh, amounts claimed um, amount to 16 billion. So civil liability is uh, having an impact. It is a risk, and, um, and uh, the civil liability risks are real. Now, what's the best defense against civil liability? Well, if it relates to the shaded box at the bottom, the annual financial statements, we directors have a number of defenses. One is we have the external auditor's report on the annual statements. We have the review report on the quarters. And we have the certification by management on internal controller for financial reporting. But ask yourself the question, what's the information that moves the market? Does the annual financial statements move the market? Well, I think they're a very important accountability report, but as Brian observed, Maybe it's the quarterly earnings have a much bigger impact on market performance and move the market than the annual reported earnings. And maybe we have the controls not really matched up against the information that really moves the market. Uh, so that, that's a question there. Um, now, the next thing is uh, when you move to the MDNA, which is in the second circle out, um, what's the control over the information uh, that's in the MDNA? Well, there's the people that prepare the information, but what's the control over the information that's in the MDNA? Well, it's largely disclosure control and procedures. Um, and the control is that management certifies that. So there is some, but how effective is that? How effective is the certification of uh, the control, disclosure control and procedures? Well, in that case, uh, Cameron, I did go back and check on a CSA, uh, 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 release its staff notice 52327, and um, it presented a review. It was done in 19, 2009 and 2010, surveyed 195 companies, and in 2010 they found that only 45% of the companies, this is 45% of the, of the 195, got a AAA rating, i.e. there was no changes required. So for 55% of the companies, they had to either change things prospectively or go back and refile or do things. Now, the CSA only looked at the disclosure. They didn't look at the process behind them. But if the disclosure is wrong, for example, companies who said that they're, uh, in their certificate that they presented uh, their, find, their uh, results of their evaluation of internal control in the MDNA, and when the CSA went and looked at the MDNA, there wasn't anything there, that would suggest to me that the process of supporting the, uh, the certification weren't really uh, highly reliable too. So the good news out of this is that the civil liability legislation gives us a defense. It says that you can rely on a reasonable investigation and a process. Okay? The problem is we have to be duly diligent to ensure the defense is available. So audit committees, I would say, is make sure that this year end audit committee meeting that uh, you ask questions about the evaluation of uh, controls and the rigor uh, to which your CEO and CFO have approached the certification process so that that defense will be available if and when you need it. In your handout material, and I think, oh, let me just say a couple of things about the MDNA. 
uh, and it reflects on some things Patricia said uh, and Don and other members of the panel. Uh, the MDNA, I think, is a critical document. It's even more so this year. At your analyst call, management is going to be first, I'm sure, one of the first few questions they're going to get, or they're going to be asking the questions Patricia said. What has been the impact of uh, uh, plunging oil prices? What is the impact of uh, the low dollar on your fourth quarter results? Um, and management's going to have to. So make sure you have that answer in your MDNA so that there's not different pieces of information that's coming out at different points in time. So uh, that'll be a critical piece uh, for this year is looking at what of all the things that Patricia's talked about, all these things that are going on right now that investors and analysts will be very concerned about. Make sure that they're expressed in your MDNA. Make sure that your non-GAAP measures in your MDNA meet the, the criteria that Cameron has talked about. Um, and, uh, and look at what's the level of, because the other thing that investors will be interested in is what's the go forward impact? In other words, what's the risk assessment uh, of, you know, that uh, oil doesn't recover uh, quickly? Uh, how does that impact you and your business? Um, so MDNA very critical for this year and uh, anticipate the questions that are going to come from your analysts and make sure you're proactive in dealing with them in the MDNA. Um, final piece is, uh, as, uh, as kind of leave that disclosure universe thing is impact on the audit committee. The audit committee is already an overworked audit co uh, committee of the board. Uh, and when we start talking about cyber risk and uh, uh, disclosure risk and all of this kind of thing, then, uh, then uh, uh, how is the, uh, if you're give, delegating that to the audit committee, how, how are they going to handle that? Okay, I'm getting the signal from Don. I better move this quickly. So uh, in the next two charts are two, uh, seven questions. I'm not going to go over those in detail. Uh, in fact, I'm not going to discuss most of them at all. Um, the only reference to two. Uh, first one is uh, question four. When you're looking at the certification process, um, ask your auditors as to what their view of the certification process. They should have a good information for you on how rigorous it is, how involved was the CEO, uh, did the CEO and CFO provide the proper tone at the top? Um, so on and so forth. Was the uh, sub-certification process effective? Um, the, uh, uh, that's an important piece of information for you. Uh, the next slide, uh, question five. Very critical when you look at the issues of how rigorous did the CEO and CFO conduct the assessment of the operating effectiveness of both disclosure controls and internal control? Uh, particularly disclosure controls um, because we've got lots of work going on on the annual financial statements but that next level out particularly the MDNA and the proxy material and that kind, what's the quality of disclosure control over those so that's that let me conclude Don with a couple of thoughts on accounting estimates and I'm going to pick on th three things that, that, that uh, have been said uh, first of all Patricia made a very important point I think about are the things like the plunging oil price and the dropping loony, is this a cyclical issue or is it a structural issue? Um, and uh, that has a big impact on how we deal with accounting estimates. Um, accounting estimates uh, in the financials, we have, as Cameron has pointed out, the amount of accounting estimates is growing. We have more and more fair value information. They're all estimates. Um, um, and along with the traditional estimates like doubtful accounts and inventory and that kind of stuff. All of that's growing, so how do we cope with that? A um, couple of thoughts. One is you should make sure that you get as an audit committee an inventory of all of the estimates. Be able to then, and you have sufficient information from management that allows you to be able to understand how did they approach this? What methodology did they use? What are the key assumptions that they make? Back to Patricia. Did they make, said that, oh, this is just a seasonal issue? Or is it a structural issue? What's the sensitivity? What's the impact on earnings? Um, we're at a very, we could be at a very key point in time in terms of uh, where the economy goes. And, uh, and so how are these estimates, uh, uh, what's the basis on what they're prepared? Um, um, and uh, so on the slide are questions you might ask for management. Um, 
methodologies, sensitivity of impact, what's the degree of optimism or conservatism that's built into those estimates? And finally, again, a question for your auditors. What did your auditors, uh, how did they approach the audit of estimates? Did they apply the uh, professional skepticism that Brian talked about? And uh, for a little plug for Brian's uh, 2014 report, there's some good questions in that report, which is on a slide uh, for you, um, on the uh, questions that you should ask of the auditors in terms of how did they approach uh, the audit of accounting estimates. And finally, Don, um, I think that this year, to pick up on Patricia's comment about um, um, managing liquidity risk, and, and also her comment, which actually scared me to death, which was that most companies aren't really equipped to handle the assessment of the impacts of things that are going on. Um, is this now a uh, appropriate time to not just look at the estimates, but then put them in together and to actually stress test those estimates, play out different scenarios? What if uh, plunging oil prices in a low dollar is not cyclical, it's actually a structural change? How does your balance sheet stack up? How does your liquidity stack up? Um, so to take the stand back and do a bit of stress test, um, we've got a lot of small cap companies in Canada heavily dependent on the resource sector, for example. This is going to play into uh, going concern issues, liquidity. So I think stress testing uh, the balance sheet at this point in time, Don, is uh, something the, uh, uh, an audit committee should do. So, uh, Jim, uh, I've got lots of questions, but I think we're going to get our audience uh, engaged. There, there was actually a number of very important messages uh, there. Certainly the run around accounting estimates, how important it is. And let's not, it should be the standard hockey stick, maybe because of the structural changes and lower growth rates, single digit growth, maybe we need to look more closely at, uh, at those changes in looking at uh, accounting estimates. And Jim, I also heard the certification process, well, it's a great friend. It looks like it could be, you know, tightened up and more energy on it. But really struck me was, what about all the other non-financial information? How good is that disclosure policy around that? And who's watching that? And, and then clearly the message on data governance, uh, which everyone is dealing with. But uh, with that, let's, uh, let's go out to you. And here's the uh, question. What would it take to get uh, a more rigorous oversight of internal controls or broadly controls uh, processes into the, uh, or onto the audit committee's radar screens? Um, talk about that at your tables.